Welcome. Welcome everyone to our Microsoft PowerPoint for Beginners webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Susan Hope Bard here at TechSoup. And we want this presentation to be relevant and interactive and important uh, to the work that you do in, in your organization. So we want to thank you in advance for taking the time to answer the registration questions and also to ask you to complete the survey at the end of this event. That will help us get better at helping you. Next I'd like to talk a little bit about our ReadyTalk platform. In the left hand, on the left-hand side of your screen you should see a chat box. In this chat box you can send us all of your burning questions about the presentation. You can also talk to us there if you're having any problems with audio or visual. We have folks on the back end that can help you with that. When, we, when you do chat us a question, we will be queuing them up, so don't worry if we don't answer it right away. What we'll do is queue up the questions for periodic answering during the presentation, and then also at the end we'll save some time for questions. Uh, if you lose your Internet connection, you can reconnect to this presentation using the link that was emailed to you. If you lose your phone connection, you can redial the phone number and rejoin at any time. And there's also a number for ReadyTalk support. Keep in mind that audio will primarily come through your computer speakers. Um, but if you're having problems with that, you can simply call the, 86, the 855 number that is being chatted out to you right now. A couple of other things. We are recording this presentation, and you will be able to find that on TechSoup's webinar page in a few days. You can also review recorded webinars and videos on our YouTube channel. And as attendees of this presentation, you will receive a follow-up email that will include this presentation, the recording, and any links to resources that we talk about. And that should also come to you in a few days. If you are following along with Twitter, you can tweet us at TechSoup or use hashtag TSWebinars. We are joined here today uh, with uh, Becky Wiegand. She is our Webinar Program Manager, and she is going to be our in-house expert on PowerPoint presentations. So I'm going to allow her to introduce herself. Thanks Susan. I'm really glad to be with you today. Uh, as she mentioned, I am our Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup. So if you've joined us for other webinars in the past, you may have heard me uh, in Susan's role facilitating the events. Um, I come from TechSoup, uh, or I've had eight years at TechSoup, and prior to that spent uh, about a decade at small nonprofits in Washington, D.C. and Oakland. Oakland, California. And even though I don't really call myself a uh, school trained PowerPoint expert, I use it every day uh, for, for working with presenters who bring me their PowerPoints to do these webinars. Um, so I have I think a fair bit of insight and experience that I'll share today, especially on the, bege the beginner skills. So for those of you who are brand new to uh, PowerPoint, I think I can help you understand how to use it a bit. And I'll share some tips that I find really helpful and some best practices and do's and don'ts and things like that uh, that I've learned over the years. So hopefully you'll get something out of it. And I will be sharing today in Outlook 2013, the desktop installed version. So if you're on a different version, many of what you, much of what you'll see today will look familiar. Uh, it may be called something different or may not be in the same exact spot, but I just wanted to put that out there so you know which version I'm working on today. And I will do live screen sharing. So for anyone who would like to follow along and create their own presentation uh, from scratch with me, I would encourage you to open up PowerPoint on your desktop now, get it ready to go, and we can do some things together in a few minutes. So back to you, Susan. Thanks, Becky. And uh, we also have on the back end here, Allie Bisbegin, and she will be answering all of your technical questions, and she provides the absolute best technical support on the back end. So you'll see her chatting things out to you. Uh, a couple of uh, things about our objectives today. Um, some of our objectives are for you to gain some PowerPoint and presentation best practices, do's and don'ts. We want to help you create a basic PowerPoint presentation from scratch as Becky mentioned. Um, we want to expand your comfort with navigating the different parts of the PowerPoint. And of course we are also here to answer your questions. The reason we are having this is not only just to share out, but we also want to collect information from you about what you need from us. So don't forget to chat those questions in at any time. I'm going to talk a little bit about TechSoup. 
You can see here on the map that we do have, uh, we do serve almost every country in the world, and our home headquarters is located here in San Francisco, California. So while I explain a little more about TechSoup, go ahead and chat in where you're here from, city, state, country. We also have a TechSoup.Global website for folks that are here from outside of the country. And a little bit about our impact. Um, we've helped organizations get more than $5.2 billion in technology products and grants around the world. And these tech products and grants come from more than 100 corporate and foundation partners. And I see folks chatting in from, oh, we have some folks from Canada as well. Fabulous. All right, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Becky, our expert presenter. Thanks. I feel sort of flattered and also somewhat nervous at that designation since I, like I said, I haven't uh, been to classes around PowerPoint, but I have learned a lot of it through uh, trial and error myself. So I hope that you'll get a lot out of today's event. Before we get started, I would love to get a sense of what your current use is of PowerPoint. Do you never use it? Are you using it maybe once a year or once every few months for something like a you know, presentation to your board or at a conference? Are you using it once a month, once a week, every day? Uh, for those of you who are using it every day, I hope you won't be too bored with this since we have framed this as PowerPoint for beginners. So we are going to start from zero here. We're going to start from scratch and creating a PowerPoint and explaining some of the navigation. But I will share some tips and uh, shortcuts and things that I find really handy to help use it more effectively. But I won't get into really advanced PowerPoint usage. But I will take us through the process from using it um, from start to slideshow and sharing your presentation. So uh, I'm going to give just a couple more seconds so everyone can participate. I see we've got people in the chat commenting that they've used it a few times a few years ago. Uh, once a year they use it. We have somebody joining us from India. Welcome Ravi. Glad to have you on. It must be very uh, late there at night, so we're glad that you're staying up late for us. I'm going to go ahead and show the full results. And it looks like most people in our audience are, are either brand new to it or using it only once a year or every few months. So this is the right audience to be here. Before I start with actually sharing PowerPoint Live, I'm going to go through a handful of quick tips that help PowerPoints, whether you're using actual Microsoft PowerPoint or some other presentation tool, things that I think help uh, make them more successful. And I'll just show a picture. This is us actually in our lab. This, that's me the blonde there. And sitting across from me, whose face you can't see is Allie who's here on the back end. And this is where we're sitting right now during this webinar. And I just threw this in here just to give you a personal perspective of us running these events and kind of how we use PowerPoint each week. Some quick tips on making PowerPoints uh, engaging and captivating. Embrace those visuals. Use compelling images. People really respond well to images. If you're training people um, on an actual tool like PowerPoint, it's great to use screenshots. It doesn't have to be photos. Try to make sure that when you're presenting you're actually being your authentic, hopefully happy self, uh, because happiness is infectious. People pay more attention when your voice has some range and timber and life to it. So try to engage that and bring that into your presentation. You can use humor. You can use happiness to try and make your presentations come off better. And to use these things to tell stories. So I mentioned that you know, I wanted to show that picture at the front end of how we use PowerPoint during our webinars because I wanted to just share that we, we uh, are doing this every week, every day in many cases. And that's a little story of how we're using PowerPoint. But you can use stories in your, in your webinars to really um, convey, or not sorry, in your webinars, but in your presentations to really convey the message to engage and connect with your audience. And then I also have engage, which is related, but uh, I just want to really put that out there that the more engaging you can make your slide deck, the more interactive. So if there are opportunities, if you're doing this in real, per real life with an audience in person, that it's not just you talking at them for an hour, that it's you engaging them. If you're doing it online, it's by offering things like live polls or talking to people in the chat. Um, 
asking them for their input, their feedback, what they're learning, what they want to learn. So it's really giving those opportunities to engage that help. Now for PowerPoint specifically, I have a few tips on what to use it for and what not to use it for. So you want to use it for presenting those engaging live or online presentations, for visual aids, for help, helpful reminders and keywords. You want to use it to show, not tell. And I'm not following all of my own rules here, but don't use it for that long form written content, and don't use it to read from the screen. So you don't want to have you know, paragraphs upon paragraphs of content that you read directly off the screen because that will bore your audience to death. And I have that cute little picture of a little girl asleep at her computer because we don't want that to happen to your audience. Some other tips for success, uh, regardless of whether you are in a live room with people or whether you are in an online environment like today, staying calm, keeping your wits about you, showing enthusiasm, and being authentic because people came to hear you, not to look at and read a slide deck of canned information. They really want to be able to connect. And you know, whether it's with your cause that they care about, whether it's you that they care about, whether it's um, whatever issue you're presenting on that's important to them, even if it's a presentation to your board, if you're presenting on what is most uh, effective from your programming work that year, or where you most need their help, you really want to make that authentic connection with them. And you can do that through some of these tips about you know, using your sense of humor and considering the audience that you're speaking to. You don't want to go into a room, and that's part of why I polled at the front end. You don't want to go into a room to say, I'm going to present a webinar for advanced users and find out that, oops, they're actually all beginners. <laughs> so you'll be presenting content that would be way over their head. So keep these things in mind as you plan your presentation. And then some quick do's. And this is actually on PowerPoint, and this is more logistical do's. So keep in mind uh, color combinations. And this isn't so much for the design aesthetic. It's for readability. You want your audience to be able to read and understand what your slides say. So high contrast colors. You don't want to put a bright yellow background with light green text because no one will be able to read it. Same with the standard readable fonts. And that can also come into play if you go to share your PowerPoint with somebody and they can't open it because you are using a font that's customized, that's only available on your desktop, or that you had to pay for. If that person can't pay for it or doesn't have it on their desktop computer, they won't open it, or when they do open it, it will look all funky. So you don't want that. You want to use the standard readable fonts like Arial, um, Helvetica. You know, there's a bunch of them. And you can Google online um, what fonts are the best to use for PowerPoints. They may not be the flashiest or sexiest of fonts, but they will help ensure that your audience can read what you want them to be able to understand. Um, as I mentioned before, using keywords instead of full sentences. You don't need to write big paragraphs of text out. This isn't the place to do that. Um, use those larger font sizes. You know, I recommend 20 and up. Some people recommend 36 and up. So using large fonts, and that also helps you keep in mind how much text to put on a screen keeping the balance of white space so it's not huge chunks of paragraphs. They can be really hard to read. Um, the next tip I included is just to include links to embedded videos. So if you plan to put a video in your PowerPoint, it may not play for everybody depending on the version that they're looking at it in. So make sure that you're including a link to wherever that video lives. Compress images, and I'm going to show this later. Uh, I include this because this is a tip that I just realized a lot of people don't know that when you go to send your PowerPoint by email to somebody, and it turns out that it's 27 megabytes, it's not emailable, you have to find some other way to share it. Well, a lot of people don't know you can compress your images within that file to make it easier to send. You can do it a couple different ways, and I'll show that later. Spell check, very important to make sure that you are uh, maintaining credibility while you are running your events. Um, practice. That should be a clear one that most people should try to practice before you actually do your presentation to test out timing, test out how things actually feel in real time. If you are showing something live on the screen like what I will be doing today, it helps to have practiced beforehand. Um, I mentioned already using images and visuals to keep it interesting to look at. Credit your sources and images. You will notice throughout this webinar you will see little links to photos that these are not my photos. These are images that I sourced off of Flickr's Creative Commons. And I want to give credit to those people because they are not mine. So if you are using other people's images, try to be respectful of their property and credit 
and ideally use those Creative Commons um, use those Creative Commons uh, images so that you know you've got permission to use them. If it's all rights reserved, you want to be respectful and ask for permission first or, or pay for it if it's something you need to purchase. Um, and then a couple of don'ts, and then I will get to the live uh, presentation of sharing my desktop. So one thing to not do is to underline text because people think they're hyperlinks and try and click on them in a PowerPoint, and they may not be clickable. Now, during a webinar within ReadyTalk, any of our links are not clickable on screen, and that's a limitation of the, the tool today. But within the PowerPoint deck, the links will be clickable. And for those of you who registered within the past, I don't know, 10 or 12 hours, or who got that final reminder email this morning, you'll find that this PowerPoint deck is attached and downloadable on the right side of that reminder email. So you can open it up and follow along. We made a couple of changes this morning, so it's not exactly the same, but it is very similar to uh, what I'm presenting right now. So if you want to be able to follow along and take notes, you can do that. These next couple ones are, uh, well actually this one, avoiding too much animation and easy on the clip art. These are things that I think simpler is often better at conveying your message because you really want to pe have people engaging with you, your voice, what you're presenting. If they're watching you, you want them to be looking at you, not looking at a flashing animated GIF on your screen. You certainly can use them, but it's ideal to really use those sparingly because they'll be more impressive too if you use them sparingly. Okay, now on to the basic setup of PowerPoint. Now you'll see if you have the deck open, I have pre-created a whole bunch of slides on how to create a new presentation and walk through all of these steps with little parts circled. This is there for you to have as a reference later, but I'm going to go ahead and share my desktop and do some of this live on screen right now. So uh, feel free to take notes on the slides if you have them, but know that you'll get these. Uh, in a little bit or within a few days you'll get them again. Uh, but you should have gotten them on the right nav of your reminder emails as well. So you can open them up and follow along as much as you'd like. So I'm going to go ahead and share my desktop. And when I do that, just know I won't be able to see the comments and questions coming in. So if there are things that uh, you're commenting, Susan can see them and Allie can see them and they'll be responding, but I can't. So let them know in the chat if it doesn't load up quickly enough or if something's not rendering, and I can take a breath and let it catch up for your screen. Okay? So I'm actually looking at PowerPoint, the deck that we were presenting today. And I'm going to just go ahead and move myself to that slide so that when I, if I need to toggle back here I can. So this is the slide I've got today. But what I'm going to do is just go to File, and I'm going to assume that I want a new PowerPoint deck. And I'll go ahead and just click New. I have two options here. I could go New or Open. If I'll just show Open really quickly. If I click Open, I can select from Recent Presentations, which you'll see a whole bunch here. I can select from slides that are already saved in my OneDrive if I have that set up and I'm saving files to the cloud. I can select from my computer. So I could go there and I could select, you know, I have a whole folder that's just called Presentations. Or I can go to my Documents or my Desktop, find my files. So I can select an, to open an existing file, or I can select to open a brand new one. And so under New, I can choose a blank presentation, or I can select from any number of themed templates. I'm going to go ahead and start with a blank presentation to just show you what it looks like. I can also search for different templates and themes up here if I know of one that I like. Um, but I'm going to open up a brand new blank presentation. When I do this, it shows me a basic text box, which is this is considered the title slide, the first one that opens up. So I can click to add a title. It has some default settings. Uh, it opens up with a default of Calibri as my font and size 60 for my title slide. So I'm going to say this is my board report. I'm going to add a subtitle. Again, these are already set up here. And I'm going to say it's June 2nd, 2016. I could leave it like this and just have a blank, pretty plain white slide deck if I wanted to. I could also go up to the Design tab right up here at the top. If I click on the Design tab in the ribbon, and everyone from 2007 up should have the ribbon. If you're on a version older than that, then you may not have the ribbon. Um, 
But if I click on the Design tab, I can also find some of those prefab themes up here at the top. There's a few of them here. I can click on one. I can also then click on these little drop-down arrows and see more themes. I can see variations of this theme. So if I want to, you know, I've picked this theme, which is what I used in the sample uh, screenshots that I've included in the deck. And I can click on this little down arrow here, and this gives me more variations. So I can say I want to use this theme, and I want to select a different color theme because my colors are blue and white and orange. So I'm going to say I'm going to go with this blue theme. Now, if I don't like any of these prefab themes, and you'll see that if I hover over them, it's changing it on the deck along with me. If I don't like any of these, I can go down and customize colors. I can also just leave that blank slide and insert my own elements if I have my own design elements uh, saved as image files or vector files. I can insert those things myself. But I'm going to go ahead and just select the blue theme and assume that's the theme I want to use right now. Now I can also select if I want to do this webinar as a standard format or widescreen format. So the deck that you see in ReadyTalk is a standard format. And I can ensure that it will fit, or I can maximize the screen. I'll just say Ensure Fit. So this is the board report in a standard slide format. This is it in a widescreen format. So depending on your audience and what type of room you'll be presenting in, you may want to have a widescreen if you're going to be presenting it in a theater type environment with a widescreen. If you are presenting it uh, on a little tiny screen at the front of a church, you may want to do a standard screen format. And I think standard is still uh, the standard, I should say. A lot of companies and organizations are now using the widescreen format. So if you know that you're combining your deck with somebody else, you should ask them what kind of format are you using, widescreen or standard, and set that up. Uh, it can be a real pain to try and combine the two sizes after the, the fact because if they've got images or logos and you try to put it into widescreen format later, it may stretch and distort your images and logos. So it's good to know upfront which kind you want to use. So we've gone ahead and selected the blue theme that just happened to be one of the options here. Now this is for my main title slide. Now I can hit Enter. Like I can, I can click on this little thumbnail and hit Enter to add a new slide. And it has automatically given me a different format. So you'll see that the boxes here are assuming it's a title slide. Because this is a second slide, it automatically assumes that I want a different layout, that I want to have a title, and I want to have some text that might be bulleted. You can select the layout. You can also select different ways to add new slides. So for example, if I want to change the layout, I can right click on this little thumbnail, and I can add a new slide. I can duplicate a current slide that's in the deck. I can delete slides. I can do all kinds of things. The one thing I want to point out though is that you can select the layout from this layout menu here. And it has a whole bunch of pre-fabricated, pre-formatted slide layouts. So if I know that I want to have title and content, then I'd select this format. If I know that I need to have two columns and a title, I can select this format. So it has a whole bunch that are already here for you to select from, and you just need to tell it which layout you want. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep the current layout of title and content on this one. Um, I showed you that you can right-click to add a new slide. Another way to add a new slide is to select the Home button on the ribbon at the top and select New Slide. And from here you can also get to that same menu of options where you can select the different layouts for the slides. I can go ahead and add a title to this one. Um, for my new blank presentation, I will say I'm going to call it uh, Financial Statement because we're making this a board report. And then I can go ahead and add a summary of financial things. So I'm going to say I'm going to give a summary of expenses. I would try to make it prettier than what I'm doing here in, the, in this uh, live seminar, but I'm going to give a summary of earned income. Get to see how well I type or don't type. See my spell uh, typos. So I can go ahead and list these out. And it's 
pre-formatting a lot of this for me. I can change this. I can add my own style of bullets. Um, so there's a lot that you can do with just what's here automatically. One thing I want to mention about the format as well is that you can select to view the master slide. And this is a great way if you know you want to have your, la your uh, logo on every slide, for example. You can click on the View button or View tab sorry, at the top of the ribbon, and you can select Slide Master. Now the Slide Master is where if you want to have a copyright at the bottom of every slide, if you want to have a footer that has the date, so I could say Copyright TechSoup Global. I can have the date and I can select the format for it. I have this little widget here that has a little number sign. It's kind of hard to see, but that's going to put the page number on each of my slides for me. It's already there. I can go ahead and say I want to add our logo. So I go up to Insert, and I'm going to go select from my pictures, and I will add, let's see, see all my random pictures here. I'm just going to go ahead and pick Logo Header, and I have no idea what that actually is. Oh, it's an old logo for TechSoup for Libraries. But I can go ahead and just plop that there at the bottom of the page, and then I can exit my Slide Master. I can do color corrections. I can change the size. So if I want to change the size of this and make it a little bigger, I'm just clicking on those little corner arrows and just resizing it. I can, and I'll show later more what to do with pictures and images. But I can do all kinds of things to format that image. And my Slide Master, I can do that to not just the title slide, but I can do that to all of the, the subsequent slides. So I would set this up. Once I'm happy with what I have in the Slide Master, and this is again where you would add your own customizations so that you have this Slide Master that you can use for all of your presentations, not necessarily just the one. So you know I've got a Slide Master. It's got our logo. It's got our dates. It's got our, our copyright. It's got our design elements already in it. And I can close the Master View, and now you'll see our little logo, which is not the logo I would actually use. But just for, for today's example, you can see that this logo is now there. And now if I go ahead and hit Enter to create a new slide, it's already there. So the Slide Master is a great tool to use if you know you need to have a template that's going to be the same every time. If you want to create a single template to hand out to your marketing staff or to give to your volunteers or your board members so that they're using the consistent branding theme that you want them to use, the Slide Master is a great way to provide that. So I've shown how you can go ahead and add text. Um, one other thing that you can do with these slides, you'll see in this middle section here that there are some little icons. And if you hover over them, it tells you what those are. These are some items that you can insert into your slides. You can insert a table directly from this text box. You can insert a chart, smart art graphics, which are fancy graphics like arrows that lead up a, a path or like a funnel, all kinds of things in there. You can insert pictures, you can insert online pictures, or you can insert videos. So for example, I want to go ahead and insert a chart for my financial statement. I could do that one of two ways. If I have a spreadsheet already that this is spelled out in, I can literally copy and paste that into this just with a you know, Control-C, Control-V, or right-click copy, right-click paste. But for, for today's purposes, I'm going to go ahead and say I want to insert a table. And I'll say I want to have three columns and let's say six rows. And I can go ahead and click OK. And it automatically has inserted this table for me. And you'll see that the top of the ribbon changed to now show different table options. So it has a bunch of colors. And you can select any of these little drop-down arrows to see more options or to expand it and to see a lot of options. And these are all selected as related to my color theme that I've already selected. So these are all already considered a match, so to speak. So I'm going to go ahead and click out of that. So I'll go with what they standard suggested. And then you can see that now it's opened up under the Design tab. This Table Tools section has opened up. 
So now I can go ahead and select you know, the design or the layout of that table, and I can say I want to have more rows or columns inserted. I want to split cells. I can adjust the width of cells. All those kinds of things that you can do within an Excel spreadsheet for example, a lot of those tools have now opened themselves up because I've entered a table. So if I wanted to add some financial summary, I can say uh, assets for example, and I can say let's do here cash on hand, and I can put in some numbers. We'll just say we've got $18,000. $320 in the bank, and I can say donations from gala, and I can say we, we got $12,000 from that gala fundraiser that we did, and I can say um, I'm not sure what else would be in our financial statement, <laughs> but you, know, you may have your assets and your liabilities and your expenses, things like that all listed out here. So you can just enter these in, and it's just like a regular tabbed little table where I can click on a whole row of that table, and I can right click to delete it. And I can say I want to delete that row, and it will delete that row. And you can add rows, columns. So it's really flexible in letting you add things. Um, and you can add all different types of things. So for example, I added a table. If I want to add an image, I can go ahead and select a picture, and it will take me to my Downloads folder, you'll see pictures of me fishing with my dad, which has nothing to do with today's event, or pictures of my kids at Christmas time. <laughs> I should have had a folder set up just with uh, samples for this event. But for example, you see um, – what's a good photo here? We'll say we've got this photo of Steph Curry coming to our event at our elementary school, which he actually did. It was pretty cool. Go Warriors. Um, we want to share this event uh, or this photo of this event with our board to say, hey, what a great event this was. And we can say, Warriors visit a school program. And that maybe that's part of the work we do, and that we, we helped enable that to happen. We can enter that image in, and if I double click on that image once I've entered it in, you'll see that not only do those little squares open up that let me expand the size of it, decrease the size of it, I can rotate it, which I don't really want to do. But I can also now do a whole bunch of things up at the top where maybe it's not – you'll see that all of these photo options have shown up. Maybe it's not the brightest picture, the clearest picture. So I can go ahead and look at the corrections that it offers me, and I can do a fair amount of photo editing right within this. Now if I have a raw photo that's 12 megabytes in size, just that one image, maybe it was taken by a professional photographer, I would actually recommend that you edit that yourself outside in an actual photo program to compress that image before bringing it into your PowerPoint. Because if you build a PowerPoint with all raw huge images, you will be hard pressed to get that file size down to anything that's remotely emailable <laughs> later on. So, but it, most of us aren't working with those types of images to begin with. But I can go ahead and select, oh gee, that's a little bit too bright. Oh, that one's a little fuzzy. You, know, you can select from this to see what kinds of options what might look best. You can do color corrections on brightness. You can adjust the color itself. You can adjust the saturation. You can get all artsy with it if you want to. All kinds of things. You can create little backgrounds or effects to the photo. So maybe you want it to have a round mirror image beneath it. Maybe you want it to have a drop shadow so it looks like it's floating. You can see that little drop shadow here across the backside. So all kinds of things that you could do. You can add borders. You can add the thickness of borders. You know, a lot of different options that are available. And maybe you want to layer things. This is where you can arrange as well. Uh, you can bring things to the front or send things back. So for example, if I wanted to add some text to the top of this, I could click on the Insert tab, and I could insert a text box. And maybe I want to add some text up here. You can't really see the box very well, but I've added some text, and I can say Steph Curry. And of course, you can't see it because it's black, but I can go ahead and change that text color to white, and I can change the size of it to say 32. And I can put that over top of the image. So I can edit my images to have 
text over top of them. Um, if I wanted something to be in the background, I could also do that arranging where you bring something to the front or send it to the back. If I sent it to the back, watch what happens. Oh, my text is no longer visible there. So it's great if you want to be able to layer things. For today's purposes, I would want to have it at the front, but I just plopped it in there as an example. I'm going to go ahead and add another slide, again just by clicking on the thumbnail on the left margin, and I'm going to go ahead and click Enter again to add another slide. I can change the layout again by right-clicking on it to adjust the, lay the layout. But I'm going to leave it as a blank slide because I want to enter in a video. Now videos can play directly from within PowerPoint for most people, but some people who are in older versions of PowerPoint will find that videos won't play within which is why I always recommend including the link to where that video lives. So you can browse from a file on your computer. This is the easiest way to insert. If you already have the video on your computer, you can browse and search from YouTube, or you can add embed code. I'm going to click to browse. And I think I have one that's just called Storymakers 2016. And I'll go ahead and click that in, and you'll see uh, a video has now plopped itself into here, and I'll say this is one of our events that we want to highlight to our board. Storymakers 2016. And I want to center that title, so I'll click to center it. So you'll see the regular formatting tools, centering tabs, all of those things are available to you just like in Word or other commonly used uh, applications in the Office Suite. If I click on that video, same thing where I can expand the size, I can make it a little bigger, a little smaller. But the difference you'll see down here is that you've got a video player now. You may not be able to hear this, but I'm going to go ahead and click play, and hopefully it will play. And I think I've got my computer muted, so you won't be able to hear what's said. But there's Allie who's chatting with you on the back end, and Louis, another, another person here in our office. But I've embedded this video, so anybody who gets this by email would be able to play this video depending on the version of, of uh, PowerPoint that they're using. So, I'm going to pause that, but I just wanted to show that you can insert video, you can insert images, you can add new slides, change the format, all kinds of stuff. It's really very, um, very, uh, very adept at managing a lot of different types of content. I mentioned the compressing images thing, and I just realized I didn't show you where to do that. So I'm going to quickly click back on the one that had the image, so the Steph Curry image. If I um, click if I right click on that image, where is it? No, I'm not seeing it. Let me go to insert really quickly and see where it went. Hmm. Now it's surprising me. It's not giving me the option. Of course it does it when I'm showing it live. Huh. Where did you go? You see some real time searching for answers now here. Usually when you right click and you double click on any image, you can see an option to compress, but I'm not seeing it now for some reason. This little widget right here is the same thing, but it usually actually says compress image. But if you click on this, you can see it right up here. It's got a little picture and it's got four little arrows that kind of pull in each corner of it. I can click on that and I can compress pictures. There is a thing that actually says it, but I don't know why it's not showing up for me. I must have done something to my toolbar overnight. So I apologize for that. But the key thing to note that I think is really handy is that you can apply a compression to just one picture, or if you find that your, your PowerPoint slides are just too big to email, you can click this, un uncheck this box, and it will apply it to all of the pictures in your slide deck. Now most of us are not needing super high quality images, excellent quality to print for most purposes of our presentations. So if you're sharing this on a computer screen, you can compress most any picture unless it's a really fuzzy picture to start with. And you can also click or uncheck to delete cropped areas of pictures. So if you have any pictures that you've cropped, and those little cropped lines are still actually in that file even if you can't see them, you can tell it to delete cropped areas of pictures. Both of these actions will help reduce your file size significantly. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. You don't notice any discernible difference in the photo. It was already kind of fuzzy to begin with. But it's compressed all of the images in the file, and that would include logos. It would include um, 
any photos you've put in, any smart art, so that it's going to be a smaller file size when you go to email it. Okay, jumping back to the video, one other thing I wanted to show is when you have the video inserted, doot, 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 sorry, I'm just making sure I'm in the right spot here, and you click on the playback, you can adjust volume. So if you're adjusting this uh, and playing it live in a room and you're using your computer speakers, you should have your volume already set up pretty high for your desktop. Like right now you'll see that I have my computer speakers off and muted. But you'd want to have that adjusted too. But you can also adjust the media volume inside, uh, inside PowerPoint. You can trim your video. So if you've inserted a video that's unedited, you can actually make some pretty hacksaw simple kind of edits by cutting off the front and back ends if you need to make it smaller because video emailing is also uh, something that's going to make the file size pretty large. So that's one helpful tip. So I'm going to assume that I have created all the slides that I need just by adding new slides to the deck. And I'll go ahead and add a, a new slide just to say, thank you, board, mem Oops, my typing. board members, and to give them some accolades or something here on the last slide. I want to save my file. So I go to File, Save or Save As. And uh, again, this allows you here to compress media on this slide. If you haven't done so already for the full deck, this compress media uh, shows me, because it's not saved yet, it doesn't show me the size. So let me go ahead and just save as. And I'll save this to my presentations folder, sample board report. And I could save it to the cloud if I want to save it to the cloud, or I could save it to my desktop or to a folder. And I can click on File, and now it shows me my file size is 28.7 megabytes here in my properties on the info screen. I just got to that by clicking File, and now it shows me some details that I'm the author of this. Uh, you know, so if it's something that somebody else created and you're using a version of theirs, you'll see who originally created it in case you have any trouble with it. You know who to go ask. But it's 28.7 megabytes. If I click to Compress Media here, and I say, I only need this to be Internet quality. So I'm going to go ahead and compress. And it goes through a compression where it's not only going to compress the images, but it will compress the video size too. And it didn't save me a whole lot of space because I didn't have a whole lot in there, but that video file is the big piece of it. Um, so you may need to actually strip out the video if you need to be able to email this to somebody and just include the link to the video. Um, so it shows me the size. You can compress it even smaller. Oh, it's not letting me do that because I've already compressed it. But you can compress it to low quality, uh, which will make it even easier to email. A couple of other things I recommend doing before you share is to check for issues. And this is something where you can inspect the document to say like, did I leave something maybe off of the slide in the background that I should delete? Could be taking up space. Do I have notes at the bottom of each of my slides? So I can inspect the document. And it will tell me if I've got off-slide content or if I've got things that should be removed. Um, like did I leave notes at the bottom? Now you can't see the notes here because I didn't actually add any notes. But if I clicked Inspect, I could tell it to remove all of that. So maybe I put uh, inside notes to myself here that I don't want my audience to actually be able to read for themselves. I could remove all of that upon saving it so that I can share it more easily. I can also choose if I want to print this. Uh, I can choose to print it on the whole presentation, or I can print just certain slides. The, the part that I think is helpful that, Ready, or sorry, that PowerPoint offers is that you can select from this dropdown here if you want to print on both sides or just one. And you can print full page slides, or you can print six slides to a page for example. Or you can print. So if you know that you're going to an event where you're going to hand these things out to, and you want to save on paper and just provide somebody with the opportunity to take some notes, you can choose. I want to have four slides on a page. I want to have two slides on a page, or three, with an opportunity for them to take notes. So this is a great little feature that PowerPoint has as well. I'm not going to actually print anything right now, but that's, um, that's just showing kind of where the, the saving features are. 
And I've talked about how to insert things. And again, you can do inserting directly from these little um, icons in the center of your text box, or you can insert from the Insert tab where you can insert pictures, smart art, shapes, charts. Um, way over here you can insert videos. You can also insert audio. So if you want to have little audio clips, you can insert that there. If you want to record a narration, create a slide deck and record yourself presenting it and save that all as a single package, you can do that. Um, I've shown in the design section where to select different themes, where to select the slide size whether standard or widescreen. Now let's look at transitions and animations. Transitions are the movements that sometimes you'll see between slides. So it's when you see a slide spin from one to the next. So for example, I'll fade between slides and I'll show that. I don't know if that showed up for people or not with the screen sharing. I could slow it down probably. Did it show up for folks? Let me know in the chat if you're able to see. I'll do a push slide. So it's transitioning between slides, moving across the screen. This is what I recommend using pretty sparingly because some of this can come off a little bit tacky. Um, so transitions, this is to move between slides. Um, you can include audio clips. So I won't play it because I've got my computer speakers um, muted, but you can't hear it. But you could actually select if you want a cha-ching of coins when you've completed your financial summary report, you could have it cha-ching as it transitions to the next slide or, or something of that nature. If you want somebody to applause, thank you board, you could have an applause there. But again, sparingly because I think that can come off as uh, a little bit too maybe juvenile. I'm not sure what the right is, word is for that. But so that's what transitions are. You can set the sound. You can have transitions happen when you click your mouse to move between slides. Um, so you can set the amount of time that they last on screen, and you can preview them to change and, and adjust those as you want. Animations are when you want to have the text on your single slide move or, or change how it comes onto the screen. So for example, if I highlight this text, I can have it fade in. And I don't know if that was visible because of the screen rendering, or maybe flying in would be more visible where it kind of floats up onto the screen. And again, you can have these come in really slowly. You can have them swirl in or you know, again, I would use them pretty sparingly. And you can decide how long you want each of these to last. Uh, I think if you use these in a really limited way, they can be really well received and executed. But again, not too much of either of those. Um, and now I want to show how you can actually play your slideshow. So I'm going to click on the Slideshow tab. This allows me to customize how I want to have my slideshow set up. Uh, I can also select, I don't know if you can see on my screen, this little tiny slide icon at the top. This is part of my Quick Start toolbar, which if you, or Quick Access toolbar. Um, you can customize this to have the buttons that you most frequently use appear at the top. Uh, so I have the slideshow button there. You can also click to play slide from the beginning or, or slideshows from the beginning or from the current slide. And you can also get to your slideshow by clicking this little icon down here. It's the same icon that you see in the very top left. It's just in a little bit of a different format. So you can click to start your slideshow. I'm going to say I want to start it from the beginning. And you'll see my screen should change for you to just show the board report. Now because I'm presenting within presenting, it's a split screen. And I don't know if you're seeing the split screen or if you're seeing the full board report screen. I can't tell what you guys are seeing. So um, you can hit Enter to advance through slides. You can also select the right arrow. Okay, so you're seeing the split screen too. So you're seeing the main slide and then the slide that's coming up next. And the only reason you're seeing it like this right now is because I'm live in a presentation in ReadyTalk. But normally, if we were just playing it live, you would just see your, uh, your board report opening slide open up. Um, and I can't actually see – you can see these. Okay. So the um, markup tools down here at the bottom will let you zoom in. So for example, if I want to go – I'll hit Enter and go to the slide that has 
some of our asset summary. If I want to zoom in on any of that, I can just select this mouse and I can zoom in on that section. If I want to circle something, there's a pen and I can select a highlighter or a laser pointer to use to point. And I can do that with my mouse or I can use my really clunky um, little touchpad <laughs> that I just used to circle that. And if I want to erase that, I can just select to erase all ink on slide or use the eraser. So there are also arrow options so people can see my arrow on screen. Um, and then you can have it show all of your slides as another option of markup so people can see what's coming. Anytime you want to exit the slideshow, you just hit Escape and that takes you back out. Hit Escape again, and because I had annotations on there, it's asking me if I want to keep those on or if I want to discard those. And that's the little red pen mark that I made. I'm going to go ahead and say Discard, and now it's taking me back to my regular slide. Now a couple of things to note when you go to set up your slideshow is you can um, click Set Up Slideshow right here. And this is where if you are going to a conference for example, and you are going to exhibit, and you've got a a monitor set up, and you're going to have some slides showing about your organization, you can select check this box to just continuously loop your slide deck. So you can use PowerPoint to just be playing a slide deck. Or maybe before your gala starts or before your event starts, you just want to have it playing through pictures of your patrons for your library who have, are wearing t-shirts that say, Love My Local Library. You can have it play through your deck for you. If you have narration, you can have it show without the narration because maybe you want to narrate it verbally. If you have animations, you can select to not have it show them in the, the, narr sorry, the animations during that. So you can set up a number of details and customize within this. One other great feature that I love, uh, and actually there's two um, <laughs> that I love, is that if you want to share this with an audience, say your board or your volunteers, um, or another branch of a library, or another chapter of your church, or your, your membership organization is um, watching the slideshow too, but they're not on site. You can click this Present Online. If you guys are set up to use Microsoft Link, you can use Link to share it live. Or you can use the Office Presentation Service, and that's free. But anybody who's got that link can watch you present your slides in real time. So this is a great alternative to uh, somebody who may not have a live conferencing tool like ReadyTalk for example, where you can click this and share that link with your audience that you want to be able to watch with you. They may need to dial in by phone to hear your audio unless you've got it pre-recorded with a narration. But they can watch you presenting the slides, you pointing your mouse around with the online office presentation service. So that's a great feature. I think it was only introduced in I want to say the 2010 version. It might be 2013. So we'll have to double check when that was introduced. But it is in the last couple of versions of Office. If you've got 2013 or 2016, for sure it's available. Um, the other feature that I love is that you can record your slideshow. So if you need to make a short training video where you're showing your staff, hey, here's how to do uh, an expense report in QuickBooks or how to reconcile your, your bill, and you want to send that to uh, your new accountant or your new operations director. You can record your slideshow from the beginning or from the current slide, and this will record your audio and what you're doing on screen. So you can create short, simple screencasts of your slide deck without needing to have a tool like ReadyTalk or a tool like Camtasia or a tool like um, Snagit. You can make short little screenshots screencast with this uh, feature. So great little extra features just to highlight quickly. Um, I am just about at time, so I want to go ahead and wrap us up. I think I already showed print options. And so what I'm going to do is bounce out of sharing my desktop live, and I will take a few minutes to answer some questions. But for those of you who are uh, interested in getting the latest version of um, PowerPoint. You can do so in a couple of different ways. And then I will get to some questions. So I just wanted to show different ways to get donations for eligible nonprofits, public libraries, churches, foundations. We have standalone 
donated PowerPoint licenses available. You can get either PowerPoint or PowerPoint for Mac, and you can get these as individual standalone products. It allows you to select which version you want. So if you want a multilingual pack that's in Spanish, you can get the PowerPoint in Spanish. If you want to have PowerPoint 2016, great. If you have stuff that only works with PowerPoint 13, you can also downgrade to that version, or you can install just that version. We also have PowerPoint for Mac. Some of the features are a little bit different. Most of them are the same, but some of them may be found in different places. I demonstrated today on a PC, so I used the PC version. But you can get to all of these don donations at TechSoup.org slash Microsoft. That's for standalone PowerPoint, but you can also get it as part of the Office Suite. So there's Office Standard, which includes the suite of six Office products. I'm not going to list them all off, but it's your Word, Excel, PowerPoint, a couple of others. Office Professional Plus, same six, but also includes Access and Link, and I'm not sure what else. Um, and then Office for Mac. And then there's Office 365, which is the cloud version of Office that you can um, access through the donation program as well. And I'm pointing folks to TechSoup.org slash Microsoft dash software dash nonprofits because there's some great introduction videos about the program that just tells you a little bit more about the donations. And then the last thing I'll mention is that Microsoft Philanthropies, which is their new name for all of the charitable things that Microsoft does, um, has a variety of services and products to help you, those of you on the line with us today, become a modern nonprofit with access to Office 365, Dynamic CRM, Azure, which is coming soon, and we'll continue adding tools like Power BI that's a free dashboard and data visualization product. So lots of great things to find there. And so I just included the link because this is a new way that they're packaging their, their products for donation for nonprofits. So with that, I want to go ahead and get us started with questions because it seems like there's a lot of them. And I'm happy to share my desktop uh, again. So Susan, what do we got? Um, there. Sorry. There are a couple of questions uh, going back to the widescreen format and when it's appropriate to use the standard or the widescreen. And if you can switch it midway, what would happen? Gotcha. Well, I recommend picking one and sticking with it. Um, now for our webinars, I have a standard deck that I use with the standard format, and I have the same exact deck that I use for the widescreen. So I have both always at the ready depending on who I'm working with and who I'm presenting with because I might get slides from somebody else. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share one more time really quickly to show something else that I think is super useful. Um, so if I'm in my slide deck for example, and I'm back at my design layout, and I am picking my slides. Standard is what you would use for your standard. Um, most monitors that are not explicitly widescreen support standard really well. If you have a widescreen monitor or work primarily on a laptop, or if you know you're presenting in an environment where you're using a widescreen, sort of theater widescreen, then it's great to use the widescreen. Now I often get people who send me a deck and I have to combine them both. So for example, I'm going to open up the slides that I have today, and I'm going to go ahead and just copy a slide just for no reason, and I'm going to paste it into this deck. Now when I go to paste, if I right click, this is something I use a lot. And I don't know if you're combining slides that you know, your board member had a slide that you want to use, or you're going to take something from an old deck that you used, but the format's different. You can select to use the destination theme, meaning I can have that slide that I just copied take on the theme of this deck that I'm pasting it into, or I can keep it with the format that it originated with. So I, maybe I want it to look the way that it did in the other deck. Or I can just copy and paste a picture in. So if I want to keep the source formatting, I can paste it in here, and it's got my TechSoup differently branded format. If I paste it and I want to use the new destination theme, it should – oops, it's not doing it now because I pasted, or, pasted it in already. But let me copy another one. And let's see if it will do it here if I paste it in up top. If I paste it in and I say I want to use the destination theme, now you'll see that same content came in, but now I've got the theme of the deck that I just pasted it into. So it's a handy way to keep your deck looking one way if you want it to, or to 
get somebody else's deck to adopt your new format. Now you'll have to tweak things because look at the title runs right into this box. So I may have to move things around if I do that, or I might need to you know, widen the title box or change the font size. But it lets me do that so I can keep themes uh, either combining different themes or I can make it a consistent theme throughout. Okay, what other questions do you have? Um, we had a couple questions come in about highlighting things during the live presentation and using those tools, how to erase them, how to make them go away, come back. Sure. So if I go to play my slideshow, and I'm just going to say I'm going to start from this current slide, you see these markup tools here down here. And when you see it on your actual big slide, which it's not showing it here, but they'll actually almost be invisible down at the bottom of the screen. You won't really see them until you highlight over them. So you can't see them there because that's not where they are in this view. But you click on it. If you want to use your highlighter, and I say I'm going to highlight this right here, I can highlight it. I can highlight I want to use this format and this format only. If I want to erase that, I select that same little pen and laser pointer tool. I can go ahead and select that I only want to erase one thing, and it gives me an eraser that I can take on screen, and I just click it, and it will erase it. Or I can click on Erase All Ink on Slide, and that would clear any markups that I've made on the whole slide. So like if I had already uh, penned on something and highlighted two other things, and I click that Erase All Ink, they will all disappear. The zoom, you zoom in. You want to unzoom, you click it again. Oops, it didn't work for me. But you can click Escape and it will zoom back out. Escape is your way to get out of the slideshow anytime you want to get out of it. And you have to escape twice. Um, you can also see other slideshow options here. So if you want to hide a slide, or if I want to hide the presenter view, uh, it's not showing up how that looks for you guys for me right now, but it may have gone into the big solid screen? Not sure. It's hard to tell with a presentation in a presentation. I realize we're over time, so uh, do you want to have me do any more questions or just wrap up at this point? I think if we could have one more question. A couple people had uh, questions about how to use spreadsheets in the PowerPoint, um, the advantage of using a table in PowerPoint versus importing something from Excel or copying and pasting. Copying and pasting. Sure. So for example, I'll open this class data sample. And if I have a table I want to copy in, and I, this already exists, copying in a table is for sure your easiest method uh, to just go ahead and copy it in. Um, and are you guys still, you're still seeing my desktop, right? So if I, let me go back to my sample one. If I have an empty slide that I want to plop this into, I can just click, I can click wherever I want, frankly, to paste it in there, and it'll convert it to a table for me. So certainly if you already have data elsewhere, I would recommend just copying it in, adjusting the formatting. If you don't like the color, you can double click on it and all of your table options show up again where you can select the color, you can select the format. Um, so you have all of these options to make it prettier. Um, so I don't recommend reinventing the wheel if it's something you already have elsewhere. But it was just as easy as Copy, paste, but you could right click to do that, or you can use the keyboard shortcut. Okay, so we are three minutes after. So I'm going to go ahead and pop back out of the screen sharing, and I'm going to let Susan wrap us up. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Becky. That was a lot of information, and we still have a lot of folks who want more. People are asking about the next PowerPoint um, for advanced beginners. Um, but very quickly, before you log off and complete your survey, if you don't mind sharing with us one thing that you learned today or something that you're going to share with your coworkers, go right into the chat box and do that. And I'm going to review some upcoming events. Um, the next event we have is on the 7th, How to Get Tech Donations Before Fiscal Year End. Then we've got another beginner's webinar on Microsoft OneNote. And on the 14th, Adobe Premiere for Video Editing and Production. And then we have on the 15th and 16th, uh, One for Libraries, The Changing Landscape of Library Privacy. And on the 16th, we have one for Early Learning Professionals and about helping children build literacy skills for the digital age. 
And uh, make sure you do chat in what you learned today. And be sure to complete the survey. Um, we really appreciate your time. We know the most valuable thing uh, you can give us is your attention. So we really appreciate your time today. A huge thank you to Becky for putting this together and sharing her expertise. I can tell folks loved it because they had so many great questions and they want to learn more. We also want to thank Allie on the back end for helping with all the technical support. And of course, a huge thank you to our webinar sponsor, ReadyTalk. Um, Thank you again. We hope you have a great rest of your week and a wonderful weekend. Be sure to complete that survey. It will pop up shortly. Have a wonderful weekend.